is the uh, facilitator and coordinator of... He left, he disappeared, he's afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he's the coordinator of the Decoloniality Reading Club, which is a group of about 50 students that we have at the university that meets on Wednesdays um, around lunchtime, if time permits, for us to just do some reading on um, decolonization, colonization, modernity, as it were, um, and trying to find almost anarchist spaces where we can start reading on this kind of scholarship and develop our own network and this um, library of readings that we can pull from. Um, so I think the Decolonity Reading Club has been in existence now for about a month and a half. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah month and a half officially, but it started off as a group of um, students from the Faculty of Law and students from Pan-Africanist spaces that decided to meet and gather on, at lunch times. So what we've done is that we've then just institutionalized it so that it becomes a space um, for students to, to come together and read and uh, discuss around issues of higher education and transformation. So we thought it would be so great, Prof, to have you, um, you know, just assist us and also have a discussion with us on uh, readings um, and just maybe some of your thoughts on epistemologies of the South as well, um, so that we can have a discussion as well in our own spaces with a better perspective from um, the author himself. So there were two readings that were sent out to everyone. What we usually do is that the read, people read, and then when we come back, we then discuss and we have a, a chat and ask the questions, clarities on concepts and so on. Um, so in essence, I think people have prepared a few questions. I think also if you would like to also just introduce us and take us through your thinking when you were writing um, uh, on, abyssal think on abyssal thinking, especially um, in epistemologies of the South, that would be great. But in essence, it's a, it's a discussion, it's a chat, it's a conversation for us to get clarity on some of the concepts that have come through from your writing um, to almost propel us forward then in our, our Have you read something of my work? What? And, um, if it's knowledge of the South Chapter 4, which is what the uh, recommendation was. Well, that's wonderful. I, I like to be among students. I just come from uh, other sessions, one at uh, Witz, another at Rhodes, uh, with students that, in fact, are in these uh, reading clubs. Um, so I'm very pleased to discuss with students this, uh, this issue. But what is your reaction to have in front of you a guy that is a white male? In fact, originally from a country that was a colonizer, uh, talking to you about decolonization, what do you feel? <laughs> Maybe we can have everyone coming closer, just on the couch as well, so they're not too spread out this way. Is that fine? Yeah, come closer. Otherwise, uh... Also, I'm, I'm not necessarily facilitating properly. No, you are facilitating well. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you are doing well. We're more just, um, we, we like to minimize the hierarchies when it comes to the conversation. Absolutely. As much as we can have a conversation hold them, um, we'd like to not think of that person as a sense maker or a provocateur or anything like that. Yeah, good. <laughs> Wonderful. So what do you think? Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm asking a question of identity, right? It, after all, is a, is a question that is important in, uh, in our discussions and that we should uh, start from here. Because there are two ways of looking at these things. It's uh, uh, where you come from and which side are you on the struggle. That's okay. Hey, now I'll try. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't like speaking first, but then okay, it's fine. Okay, your question, right, about a white person speaking more social on decolonization. I, for one, feel like... <laughs> I feel like maybe... Hey, I feel biased. You know, more especially on your end, or maybe you. I feel like the greatest, the greatest, the greatest problem with that is that now we're at a point where our oppressor is defining our struggle for us, and that in itself is very problematic, right? And never mind in that, we are now. You know, when the oppressor defines the struggle for you, he will also give you ways in which he is comfortable with, you know, on how to actually even address this very challenge. You understand? So now I feel like, in as much as I, I get. But yeah, that is just me. Or I feel like, hey, yeah. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. More reactions? Yeah. Um, for me, I've also got a, a, a 
little bit ambiguous about um, the, 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 the perspective that you are bringing to us. Because uh, I'm thinking in my mind that um, as a white man, right, you, you represent... Um, I'm white here, because yes, in, yes. Uh, in the United States I'm Latino. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, attention to that. Okay, so what I'm thinking is this. Um, when I read the, the readings that you, you provided for us, that you provided for us, um, I kind of got a, a certain thought in my mind that what if um, the philosophies that the, 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 the perspectives that you are giving to us that do that that you that, that are in your readings are in a manner trying to um, sway us away from the real um, cause of sure. the colonization that we are having, which is basically violence and, 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 and the maintenance of power true e economics and i feel like the fact that we are moving in another direction you know in a way it makes me think couldn't it be that in a way this form of, of knowledge that you're giving to us could be misleading us and selling us into another way and making us ignore that um, mm -hmm. um because you do mention in a sense that you know there is a certain level of violence you know that is maintaining, you know, the, the colonial societies and the so-called Abyssal line. But then the recommendations that you're bringing for us are the, epistem the, are the, the epistemologies of the South, right? You, you want us to bring out the epistemologies of the South so that we can include them in the curriculum. But I feel like in a sense, it doesn't really address the fact that we are being bullied, you know? We are being bullied in a sense that when we are colonized, there was a lot of violence involved. And even now, that violence also involved the extracting of our resources. And we, we do not know how to own our resources because as soon as we try to do that, there's a lot of violence that is, that is perpetuated. And most of the countries that come from Europe are very powerful in terms of their military. And, in terms of, and one of the things that are making the military very powerful is, their, is the fact that their knowledge when it comes to science is ahead of us in a way. So I feel like, um, in a way, the fact that the knowledge comes from you, there could be a chance that maybe you could be going to this side. But a lot of the things that you are saying are true. You see. I, 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 I want to ask. Uh, oh, you I see you. Okay. I see you. I'm seeing you in the reflection there. Um, there's something that uh, Grace Adayose speaks about. Uh, I think she's a Nigerian scholar from uh, UJ, well, she's currently at UJ. And she speaks about this concept of positionality when it comes to discussions on decolonization. As to my positionality, my, where my feet are, my mode of analysis, how much can I contribute to the decolonization discussion um, outside of where I am? And I think for me, that, is, that becomes the main question of identity here, um, that your mode of analysis and how you're viewing the decolonization and the type of concepts you're bringing about, um, for me, transgress or go beyond then those barriers of positionality, where it's able to speak to the South in its totality and not to you as a man. So I think for me, I, I, I also then want to marry it with this idea of not necessarily seeing a white man, but wanting to distinguish to myself between white men and whiteliness. Mm -hmm. Whereas whiteliness goes beyond the, the, the skin pigmentation mm -hmm. for me, that a black man can also come and carry then whiteliness mm -hmm. that then has a mode of analysis that we're trying to reject. So that, that for me becomes where I am on that discussion of identity. Um, for me, it's about this this idea between theory and lived experience. So, um, in reading about the university, in reading about global south and global north, you see this, this this flow of knowledge, right? But this flow of the other. So the data is extracted from here, but the theories are made in the north. So for me, it's about yes, you are seen as a white person that always that I feel also very ambiguous towards towards that. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Because essentially, anyone can theorize about things, right? But to live in it, to have experienced it, is a different dimension that is added. So um, yeah, so that is also um, my two cents. 
And also this idea of positionality is very important. Um, Bupana Raisele's latest book speaks about the world looks like this from here. So when do we get a chance to define for ourselves? When do we get a chance to do that? Um, the space to do that? Um, maybe we want the tools to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm very glad that I started one with this question that will uh, help you. I have a, a great experience of these debates, I have to say. And, um, and I'd like to start by, there are some things that we should know about ourselves. Usually when we, we come, uh, yes, I didn't do this today, but yesterday at Rhodes and in Wits, I asked each one of the students who were they were, what they were studying, where they come from, and so on. It would help, probably, for us to know each other. Well, where do I come from? Yes, I, I come, in terms of struggle, I come from the anti-colonial movement, quite frankly. I don't know if you know that the Portuguese colonialism lasted until 1975, right? Angola, Mozambique, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Son Tomé Príncipe, and the uh, Cape Verde Islands, they became independent in 1975. Up until then, I couldn't travel to the colonies because the government didn't trust me, because I was in the anti-colonial movement. And one of my great influences in my work is Amilcar Cabral, as I'm going to show this afternoon. So, when the, these countries became independent, of course I came. I, my friends were ministers here in Mozambique, nearby, in Angola, and I've been collaborating and conducting uh, non-colonial studies, and then we can express what is a, a non-colonial, binational type of team, in which we don't uh, proletarianize the, the colleagues from Africa, but we try to work on an, on an equal basis, I can, then we can spell out that. And uh, so the biographical note is that, is that which side are you on the struggle? And what have you been doing on that side? Because I think that uh, the questions of identity have to be understood in general. That's my experience with indigenous, I'm not indigenous, right? But I have a large experience of working with indigenous peoples in Latin America. And uh, sharing their struggles and be with them. For instance, right now, we are in a struggle in Ecuador, because you know, probably from the news, that the indigenous movement in, uh, in Ecuador managed to stop the country against the, I the IMF. The IMF, the World uh, Monetary Fund, has been trying to impose very strict policies in, uh, in uh, Ecuador. The indigenous movement organized, it's the third time that they organized in this way, and paralyzed the country. And they already uh, led to the renunciation of three presidents. Well, I've been very much involved in that struggle with them. Uh, how do you do? How do you go along? That is to say, in struggle, as you are going to probably know if you read more of my work, the important thing is the struggle. And that's why the epistemology of the South, that's why it's different, the type of things that I do from the things that you usually probably read in the decolonial paradigm of Latin America, which is really probably, may have some of the deficiencies that you are analyzing. And that's why I prefer to speak of epistemologies of the South. Well, let's see then the first thing. In the struggle, there is not a question of truth in terms of knowledge. It's a question of trust. Can I trust you? Where have you been when I was in this struggle? When I was doing this, when I was being beaten up on the street? Did you help me to go to court? Did you help me to get an, a lawyer? Were you in the struggle with me? So the questions of trust are absolutely fundamental. So I dedicate a lot of, me, of my work to decide that in terms of epistemology and knowledge, the question is not so much the truth. 
but the trustfulness of things. So, can I trust your knowledge? <laughs> can I trust your person? Do you say one thing and do a thing a very different thing? I think that's the, I think the criteria that we should uh, use. Probably you knew that Portugal was also a fascist country, uh, was a dictatorship until 1974. So I was also part of the anti-fascist movement and we were in favor of the liberation of the colonies. That's why we were repressed by that state, right? But then in Portugal at the same time that we reconquered democracy, the colonies were liberated was a, a kind of a concomitant type of process. So, as far as the theories are concerned, this afternoon I'll be explaining a bit better, but uh, my idea is that we are not in a, I don't like the concept of decoloniality, I never use it. Because when the concept of decoloniality was developed in Latin America, it supposes or presupposes that there is no colonialism anymore. Colonialism is over and now we have coloniality. I don't believe so. I think we are in the colonial societies. That's my idea. We live in colonial societies and of course Apartheid is a form of colonialism, now disguised as neo-apartheid or neo-apartheid. Right? And if you w live in uh, colonial societies, the question is not decoloniality, it's decolonization, because colonialism is there. I'll explain, and I can explain it now for you, why do I think so? For instance, uh, don't you get surprised that capitalism uh, is today very different from the capitalism in the 17th century, right? But we still talk about capitalism. Colonialism now is different. But why are we assuming that the only form of colonialism was the occupation by a foreign country? That's what we call historical colonialism. It ended with the independence, but that form uh, ended and it morphed into other forms. You read a book, fabulous book, every African should read it, every person in the world, Neocolonialism by Kwame Nkrumah, 1965. I'm amazed that you don't know in South Africa Nkrumah, one of the greatest leaders first president of Ghana. And remember, it was in Ghana that Du Bois, a great American black leader and intellectual, died. Nkrumah wrote this fabulous book in 1965 to show that the independence had bring about uh, the end of colonialism. There were other forms of colonialism. For instance, the control of the money, of the, the reserve currency, the money in Ghana, was controlled by the colonizer, not by them. In the French colonies, all the French in Mali, in Senegal, the, the money is controlled by the central bank in Paris. So, plus military influence, uh, plus many other things, one could see that, in fact, colonialism uh, is not over, it's with us, right? If colonialism is, would be over, for instance, it's 15,000 people that have died drowned in the Mediterranean oh, Ocean recently, if they were fully human beings, I think that would be a major revolution in Europe. Suppose that they were Europeans, 15 Europeans drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. This is terrible. People would really, do, governments would change, things would happen. But they are black Africans. They are not real human beings. 
they're subhuman. That's why in my, in my epistemology, we have the idea of the Ibisalain that divides humanity from subhumanity. There are people that are just, and I'm going to explain in the afternoon, I can explain it to you now again, that are considered subhuman. What we call are ontologically degraded in these societies. Why is that so? It is so because the societies are not just colonialists, are capitalists, and are patriarchal. The three models, and I am addressing you to your question, which I think is very important. The political economy, you think, right? It is interesting, I'll, probably you didn't read my work, because if you would have read my work, you'd see that my, all my struggle is against that. Because the people in Letra Meros, Walter Mignolos and others and so on, it looks like that we are decolonizing, decoloniality, and capitalism does not exist. For me, and why? Because these, this type of studies started in the humanities, literature, philosophy, and, and they don't deal with the political economy of the countries. Right? So I start from the assumption that since the 16th century, but particular after the 17th, domination has three heads, capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And it has always been like that. And it's today very much like that. And the drama of our time is that the domination is articulated, but our resistance is fragmented against it. Why it is articulated? For a very simple reason. And this is a Marxist analysis. My original training was a Marxist. And I decolonized Marxism because Mar Marx is very Eurocentric. That's another discussion that we could have. Is that, you know, capitalism, as you know, is based on the idea of free labor. That is to say, you sell your labor because you want, you need for your family, but you are not a slave. You may decide not to work, right? So free labor is absolutely, and you have rights. You have to, have to you pay the salary. In many countries, you get a contract. You cannot be fired like that. You cannot work for 24 hours a day, eight hours, 10 hours, whatever. So you have a contract, you are free, right? But the free labor in our societies does not sustain itself without highly devalued labor and non-paid labor. Who performs the non-paid labor? Women. Who performs the highly developed labor? Blacks and indigenous people across the world. So this highly developed, uh, highly developed labor is absolutely fundamental. For you, Europe to have middle classes and protection and so on and come here, we're fully protected. We have to have slaves in Bangladesh working for us. Your Adidas, your things like that, are done by slave-like labor. You should know that. Everything that you wear, if it is of these firms, is produced by slave-like labor. So the capitalism cannot sustain itself without this highly developed labor and non-paid labor. Who furnishes, who supplies this labor? Colonialism and patriarchy. So colonialism is intrinsically necessary for capitalism. We don't see it. If I'm in Port Elizabeth, in my hotel by the waterfront, I don't see that, of course. Something has to be done. I think that uh, I was discussing that. Um, if you don't want to discuss the land issue, don't discuss. But that's one thing that I think that, for instance, the decolonial typical discussions never engage with the questions of land issues, the political economy. But you cannot avoid that. So I, I think that we can start the conversation on that basis. Then I could have many other things that I have some doubts because, you know, 
If you apply in South Africa the decolonial paradigm of Latin America, you forget one thing, is that in Latin America, the independence was granted, granted or conquered by the descendants of the colonizers, the white people. While in Africa, the, the independence was conquered by the original people from this continent. It's different. It's not trivial. It's absolutely different. Right? So there are these differences. And uh, the other thing is that probably the decolonial thinking of Latin America, I have very good friends there. I mean, well, I'm not saying that, you know, we are a family of people that are interested in decentering Europe. But they have recentered in North America, so to say. And they think that colonialism was just the Atlantic. But colonialism was the Indian Ocean also. It was China, it was India. China not so much, but India. All the Southeast Asia. And Africa was very different from Latin America. Do you know whether when the Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama arrived here, uh, a, a bit up there in Mombasa and want to cross to, to India. Who helped him? A Swahili pilot, because he didn't know how to get to India. But the Indian Ocean at the time was fully globalized. Since the ninth century, the navigators, Islamic uh, navigators, most of them, all this Africa that would come from Kenya, Tanzania but knew that very well. There was a huge commerce of spices and so on, controlled by them. So Vasco da Gama was lost here. They couldn't know. They could go up around the, the, the Cape and so on. Uh, a very difficult uh, crossing for him, but then he couldn't go to India. So it's different. There have been different colonialisms. All of them are violent. And in my work, as you know, what distinguish colonialism is that while in the non-colonial societies, the social regulation is based on regulation and emancipation, in the colonial side, is the, the tension is between appropriation and violence. So there is no emancipation. And you... So this idea that um, we have general theories that usually teach us, particularly at law school, but in social sciences. When I teach sociology in my department, well, one of the founders of the social sciences for me is Ibn Khaldun. You never heard of him. Nobody has, definitely. He's one of the greatest thinkers ever. He died in 1403 many years ago, an Islamic scholar that wrote a fabulous book called the Prolegomena of, Historical, uh, uh, of Universal History. And uh, he is a guy that, in fact, started the social sciences. And the European social scientists benefited from him because his work was translated in the 19th uh, century in French. If you are in sociology, there is one concept that was developed by a French called Durkheim, but solidarity, social solidarity. That is a translation of Basabia, the concept of Ibn Khaldun. He translated, but never acknowledged the, the source, because this is typical of the North-centric epistemologies. They are extractivists. They never cite their sources, as we extract very often knowledge from other people by interviewing, by conducting surveys. Uh, we are even as students. Today, my students do something else, but that part of the methodology is I, I think I'm talking too much of this. So please, <laughs> I stop with more questions. Any questions? Please. Someone has to facilitate who is first and second, I don't know. Sure. Thanks, Gordon. Mm -hmm. Hi, Gordon. Um, the Mohammed is again. Mm -hmm. um, A bit louder. So, the Mohammed is again.
Oh, that's a real lemon. Oh, good to see you. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> that is really what I said? No. I was coherent? Yes, very good. Oh, good. I'm um, so glad to see you here. Yes, same here, same here. I want to have to know the group because, yeah, okay. That's right. You sent a message yes. to the group of the summer course. That's right. I knew that you were coming, but I, I thought you would be coming in the afternoon. Yes, no, I'm, I'm going to every day after the afternoon. Good, thank you. Cool. So I just have one question about um, coloniality. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of difficulty with the effects that colonialism has had in our existence, particularly in our people. Because I feel like it's it's so entrenched in every aspect of black existence that we can never really overcome it. Ever. So what worries me is fields such as post-colonialism, um, post-colonialist theory, and kind of that facet of thought. Because I feel like it's a phantom, um, it's a phantom field. Because what is post-coloniality -colon exactly in a world where Colonialism still affects even the slightest thing like how I look, my, my big moment of beauty standards. And I struggle to accept that we will never quite overcome what has happened to us as black people. And that's a very, because it's a very grim, it's a very grim thing to come to terms with. The fact that my children, my great grandchildren, will all still be affected, whether it's economically, whether it's culturally, by um, by imperialism and the pain that we carry. So, do you think that in order to heal, um, and in order to move on, and in order to find ourselves and who we are outside of what has happened to us, in order for us to move on from perpetual state of victimhood and become people and live happily, that we need to forget? Do you think forgetting is important and integral to our healing process? Do you think it's possible to forget while fighting the current colonial condition? Um, can it be done concurrently with what we have to choose with? Can we recognize coloniality and its uh, inevitable effects on us, or do we choose to forget and heal? Good, Lemon, it's so good that you are here. Uh, no, there is a third alternative. Fight against it. That is to say, Nothing is natural in societies, right? Forever. Nothing. There are things that last a long time, things that don't last that much time. I think that we cannot forget. In fact, I think that South Africa is divided between two groups of people. Those that want to forget and those that, those that do not want to remember and those that cannot afford to forget. And in the afternoon, I'll tell you which group fits in my, in my way of reading in South Africa. What you are saying is absolutely true in the sense that uh, the resilience of these forms of domination have been tremendous. And say, if they have been here for such a long time, is it really uh, credible to think that they will be one day, one way, or one day will end. We have to start from the idea that everything historical has a beginning and has an end. Of course, you are right to a great extent now, but you are not completely right, if I may say so. Why, why do you are right? I have been very impressed by this uh, young kids from Europe and not from all over the world, like Greta and the other women against the, the, the climate strikes all over the, the world, that for these kids it is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Can you imagine that? There is no planet. They are really afraid that the world will come to an end. They don't see the end of capitalism. 
that is precisely what is bringing the world to an end. Because if we were uh, uh, exploiting the nature as the peasants in Africa or indigenous people in Latin America, that would be no problem, right? So I think that many people are really coming to your conclusion, and I think it's a dangerous conclusion, that is to say. Uh, healing as a form of forgetting. And I was appalled, I was really very taken aback in Joburg when I saw signs all over the place for, against depression and uh, phone calls, phone, phone numbers, help numbers. People so depressed, so alienated and so on. Is healing without solving the problem. I think we have a systemic problem here. And the systemic problem is that you confused. Not you, of course. Because you had a great opportunity, but it was lost. You have a, an African way of thinking that I admire a lot. I don't understand it completely. I, yesterday I had a wonderful debate with a, a colleague of mine that just finished the PhD and she called herself, I'm a Zulu woman. And the, we had a beautiful discussion about Ubuntu and how you, I, you cannot translate it into English, quite frankly. Right? But when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country took place, Desmond Tutu, there was this idea that this reconciliation was Ubuntu. It was not. It was Christian theology disguised as Ubuntu. Because Ubuntu would imply reparations and restitution in order to restore the harmony. And that was out of the picture. So you had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, this uh, division between the bad victims and the good victims. The good victims are the ones that accept an apology, embrace the oppressor, and go home crying. On television, wonderful, rainbow, crane, uh, rainbow uh, land. But one is rich and remains rich, and the other is poor and remains poor. The bad victims, of course, is the ones that didn't accept that. Right? I think all of you should read Steve Biko. Because Steve Biko well, gives an answer to you. And uh, it's a pity that... Uh, Steve Bicom, because of the, you know, the grandeur of Nelson Mandela, and I'm not saying anything against Mandela, I admire him a lot, but his statue, in a sense, occulted all the contradictions of Mandela, which meant basically a peaceful, translation, a peaceful transition without touch the economic and the political system of South Africa. That was the deal. And you see the consequences now. So I think you cannot assume that this racism is going forever. Can't be. In fact, the, there are pockets of sociability in which uh, you know, racism doesn't exist anymore, in small groups, in zones, in, in groups, sometimes at universities. You know, are people that are, you know, they are not sensitive to color anymore. But there is an institutional racism going on, right? Because of this reason, because capitalism <laughs> requires that some people are less human than others, so that it can exploit them to an extent that makes capitalism profitable. So I think that we should uh, not try to heal without uh, solving the problem, because that's therapy. The problem of, of South Africa is not a therapeutical problem. It's not therapy that you need. You need, in fact, to address the social issues. I know that, you know, when I discuss the land issue here, everybody comes with the Zimbabwe ghost. And I fully agree, of course. Even though I think that Mugabe did what he had to do, quite frankly. 
Because if you read history, you always put the, as you know, in this uh, current ways of knowing that we have, the North is the solution and the South is the problem always, all the time, right? So the Lancaster House agreement that granted independence to, to Zimbabwe had a very explicit clause that uh, England will pay for the agrarian reform in Zimbabwe. They will pay the market value of the land of the white farmers so that it will be redistributed to the black farmers. They never pay. They never gave the money for that. And Mugabe waited for 30 years. And then he decided to act. Of course, he didn't act well. And if you want to know something about land issue here in the South, you have to read uh, the marvelous work of a great sociologist called Sam Moyo. Sam Moyo, M-O-Y-O, -O, from Zimbabwe. He tragically died in India in a car accident two years ago. He was a good friend of mine. He had a land institute uh, in uh, Arare. If the land issue is so important in South Africa, ask here at this Mandela University, which department is studying land issue? No question. Is someone studying it? The other day I was asking, where is the land issue being addressed at the universities? The only university that people mentioned was UCT. In UCT there is a working group there. Then I cannot surprise that uh, your president Ramaphosa, when he, he more and more speaks about new things, he doesn't use university papers. He uses papers from consultancy firms, Accenture, Deloitte. Well, the consultancy firms are paid for to reach certain conclusions. We cannot trust them. <laughs> I'm going to speak about that, about the fourth industrial revolution. They are paid for. To, to give you certain ideas of your opportunities in South Africa, which are terrible. Among, according to them, the great opportunity for South Africa is to recolonize the rest of Africa. Can you imagine that South Africa <laughs> would now become a sub-imperial power, as we call it? So but that was Nemogan, don't give up. I know that you don't give up. That, but uh, as you know, I'm, uh, you, since you were in our summer course, I'm a tragic optimist. So there are difficulties, but we should not give up because that's what they want. That we abandon the struggle. That is, it is forever. The neoliberalism is telling you that there is no alternative. This will stay forever. The problem is that things probably won't be solved in your life or your children's life. But you have to start struggling. And the struggle has to be a joint struggle against capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. We have to do that. And we have to organize forces. Students, in my view, well, I'm, we are in Port Elizabeth, well, Gandhi was here everywhere. Uh, peaceful, not necessarily violent, but uh, where the civil disobedience. I think that we need to do more of that, quite frankly. That's what we did uh, and propounded in the, in the World Social Forum. Not the armed struggle, but um, peaceful civil disobedience. It has to, to be done. More questions? Well, the other question was... Well, some... Ah, yeah. yeah. Um, hi, um, So, I don't know if you have touched on this, but I came up with Dave. But um, when I was, I think when I was reading one of the um, abstracts sent I think, of, the, of your book, there was a chapter or something about your critique of, of science or, or of modern science, right? And I'm very curious or interested to hear more about it because it's something that I, 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 I struggle with personally. I think I like the idea of, you know, evidence sort of I don't know, maybe observable or that type of thinking. I, 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 
I, I, I, I think I appreciate it in, in conversation. I think it's very useful. But I also know it's limitation, and I know, or not, I don't know it's limitation, but I know how it can be used, for example, to justify things like racism or, or sexism and such. So I guess I was hoping you could help me. Good. That's a good question, because uh, in some of the, the decolonial thinking or postcolonial thinking, uh, very often this idea comes up that uh, it is an anti-science mov movement. I learned with Emilcar Cabral, if you read, uh, it's, a, it's a pity that most of his writings are in Portuguese, but he, they are also available in English. And Emilcar, who was a great liberator of Guinea-Bissau, always said that we cannot throw away the knowledge of the colonizers altogether. We have to select what is useful to us. Throw away the colonialist side of that. But there are some knowledge by the colonizer that can serve our struggle. I apply that to science. So science as a, what I call the, the, the internal pluralism of science. I'm a social scientist, so I cannot be anti-science. Otherwise, I commit suicide, right? So, the internal pluralism is that there are different ways of doing science. Rigorous science, so to say. One way is always using the methodologies, the objectivity, as you were saying, that you can verify the results and so on. But considering that objectivity entails neutrality, that is to say, if you are objective, you don't take sides. Uh, society may be, uh, you know, oppressors, oppressed, dominant. Um, I don't care about that. I do science. That's one way of doing science. The other way of doing science separates objectivity from neutrality. Objectivity is fine. It's to respect certain methodologies that allows you to verify my work. But I have to tell you which side I am on. Am I on the side of the oppressed or of the oppressors? Why do I select that topic and not do, do, or the other topic? I select because I'm interested in capturing some forms of domination in our society. That's what we call critical science. Right? Critical thinking comes from this. It's separating objectivity from neutrality. So this is the first procedure. And if you really distinguish objectivity from neutrality, you can see that there are aspects of science that can be used to your struggle and others that have to be discarded. I think that, for instance, Marx is a, a kind of a scientific analysis, right? It's useful for certain struggles, not for all of them. We can speak about that. I had to decolonize, as I said, my own Marxism, right? Because Marx didn't pay very much attention to the colonial issue, as he paid to the capitalist issue. The second question is, that, is this. Science is bad, not because uh, it is uh, bad in itself, no. Science may be very good. The great problem with modern science is that it thinks that it is, it is on, the only one that is rigorous knowledge. All the rest doesn't count. Your opinion, your knowledge in your community, your parents, your, your uh, leaders of your community, you know, whatever they say are opinions, subjectivities. They are not, science, they are not knowledge. They are not even knowledge. They are information. They are superstition. I'm absolutely against that. I think this is responsible for a massive epistemicide in modern era. Epistemicide is killing of knowledge. The Indians were destroyed because uh, their knowledge was not valid also. The genis genocide goes together with epistemicide. And the same with the, the slaves. It was the same thing. What survived were their songs and their knowledge that managed to survive, and now we are eager to know more, and they are eager to know more. 
and to try to recover. That's what I call ruins, seeds. They are ruins because the oppressors almost destroyed everything. But they didn't destroy everything. The memories, the ideas is there. This one thing that is ruin is at the same time a seed of something new. So I think that what is in second place wrong with science is that it purports to be the only objective knowledge. If you eliminate that, if knowledge accepts to have a dialogue with other knowledges, then it's fine with me. I give you an example. I can also discuss that in the afternoon, but I'll, I'm involved in, a, involved in, a, in Brazil in a very huge movement against agrotoxic, agrotoxics. Agrotoxins are insecticides, pesticides that they use in industrial agriculture. These pesticides are uh, pulverized by airplanes, right? When there is wind, the, the, the chemical product goes into the communities, into the lungs of the people, into schools, children. We have children with cancer in the northeast Brazil, with tumors and so on. So it is really terrible, the situation. They are poisoning them, right? Well, this movement is composed of scientists, chemists, engineers, biologists, that are with us, telling us how much poison there is in a strawberry or in a mango. And then the peasants' knowledge that they know by experience what is happening to them and their agriculture because they know that now the things don't grow the same way because they are contaminated by the pesticides. So we combine scientific knowledge with popular knowledge. I call that the ecology of knowledges. It's very concrete. It's, it's all my ideas seem to be very abstract, but they, they, they come from examples like that. And it's very clear, for me at least. Well, can we take two prof and then we can uh, answer them in oh, yeah, yeah. And so we'll take two no I'm not I'm not mentioning in terms of time, I'm just trying to so that Oh um, yeah, uh, to, uh, or, uh, yes. three questions at the time. Yes, three okay, questions so at a time. Because I, I don't have <laughs> this. Okay. Three you questions. said a prof, not me. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, let's see. Do you want to also abuse my rights as facilitator and throw yeah, one in? So we'll go one, a PUA, two and three. Okay. And then I'll be in the next round. Okay. No, no, you've got four. <laughs> Abir. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Bob, you spoke about the idea of um, recolonization. Uh, you made the point that uh, we know there are forces that um, are fighting for, for, for the decolonial cause, but the recolonization uh, is actually taking place. Um, I wanted to ask, are there certain conditions um, that must be met in order for recolonization to take place? What are those conditions? And what can be done <laughs> to bring about a rapture so that uh, this recolonization doesn't take place? Um, and then my, 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 my what I attempt, what I, I, I suspect is the last question. Um, the, the, the question of China. Um, we, we, we see China um, giving these loans unaffordable loans to African countries and when they default from paying back those loans and they take over certain um, critical um, state um, assets or national assets um, such as harbors and those, those kind of things which um, are fundamentally to a country's sovereignty because I mean if you are not in charge of the harbor or if you are not in charge of your, of your um, the central bank then, then how can a country enjoy sovereignty? So my question is that, uh, is China bringing a form of um, resettled, uh, couched form of colon colonialism? Because in some of uh, my, my, my friend from Kenya tells me that actually Kenyans are, because of the conditions, how things are, and because of the fact that uh, how the political economy is in Kenya, Kenyans are actually forced by those conditions to actually learn the uh, 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 Chinese. Uh, Mandarin, and we know that China has a population problem, so there's a need for, 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 for to occupy more territory. 
But also, we know um, um, China financially refer to itself as a communist country. Whilst um, if you look closer at the situation, you realize that actually, in practice, the opposite is happening. So there's also a dire need for, for material resources. And we, we, although um, Africans have been ravaged by, 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 by colonialism and capitalism, but there are still resources that are worth tapping into. So, so in this whole um, scenario, what, what is China? What is China doing? And how should we do China? Because there are Africans that are flirting with the idea of aligning with China versus um, aligning with the uh, international, the money preferred, the world bank, and all the other uh, imperial institutions. But now you have China, and, 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 and I'm very suspicious of uh, this thing we had from China. <laughs> Second question. Uh, my name is Sipo. Uh, I'm a psychology student here. So, so um, one of the questions that uh, the question that I want to ask is to do with the Abyssa line. The fact that um, um, the people from the south, as you said, there was a line that you in your videos that you had with the, with the, with the equator, that the people that are below the equator, they're regarded as subhuman. And I think that one of the things that I'm adding on to that is the fact that when we are learning in sociology, for instance, one of the key concepts that they teach us when we were in the first year was um, the concept of solidarity, as you mentioned, that um, society moves from a, a space of mechanical solidarity to a, to a place of um, organic solidarity. In a way, it becomes more complex. And when they're saying that, in a way, they're, they're trying to say that when they got to Africa, Africa was still in a state of mechanical solidarity. One of the other theories that they also use to kind of add more onto that is um, the theory of the nature state, nature state by um, John Locke, the theory of John Locke. And what they say is that society moves from the state of nature and develops a social contract, and then it moves into a different form of a, of, of a society. One of um, the sociologists that um, I recently read about um, recently was um, a guy called Walter Rogers. Walter Rogers also explains this process of moving from a feudal state, from that feudal state to go to, to, to a state where there's slavery. And then you move from a state where there's slavery to a state where there's a capitalism, then communism, then, then um, socialism, and then all the way at the end, which is um, uh, communism. So now, one of the things that we are we're noticing, which is a trend that we are getting from, especially the university, because this is in the curriculum, is that we, in a sense, find ourselves the subhuman, because history says when um, the colonizers came to, to colonize us, they found us in a state of nature, and they were in a much more advanced state. They found us in a state where we were having mechanical solidarity, and they were in a state of organic solidarity. And those are the one of the things that they are using to rationalize capitalism and the fact that it should remain because capitalism is a manner of which people have evolved. They're also using the theory of Charles Darwin, the fact that society is evolved and people are always evolving. And the fact that people have evolved through that it, it, it links to that theory of Charles Darwin that it's a natural thing. It's based on science. The fact that people have improved and are now we are we are having a capitalist society, it says that um, people will improve. And it's, it's it's a progression that goes on naturally. For instance, one of um, there's a there's a sociologist called um, Milton Friedman. One of the the, the, the theories that he, he he proposed was that he said that. When the colonialists came to Africa, the Africans had not even invented the wheel yet. And I see that one of the things that are in our curriculum are the fact that the reason why we are colonized was because we were weaker in terms of knowledge and we had not developed. And that feeds into that abyssal line. So I'd like to hear your perspective on that, Prof. One more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my question comes from the perspective of the language question in, in, in not just higher education, but just the language question as a whole. The language. Yes. So um, as you know, my, my, my field of study is in language policy. 
um, and I also heard from states that um, there's a new language puzzle that came out, and um, I'm also in the field of multilingualism. So um, for me, um, multilingualism has been an ongoing field in, in, in higher education specifically, but um, why has it not taken um, 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 shape? Why has it not essentially um, gained momentum? I mean, there are policies and policies and policies, but essentially nothing is changing. And um, for me, this language question is quite interesting because whenever I tell people that, that this is my field, I'm in um, my language my language policies, um, they always tell me, yes, but are we not isolating ourselves? We are um, promoting multilingualism. And um, so for me, this, this, this um, relationship between universities located in the global north and universities located in the global south is an interesting relationship for me because essentially what people are asking is that um, should we not, we need to be recognized by universities in the global north. So through multilingualism, are we not isolating ourselves in that way? So um, for me, the question is, who is setting the requirements for this, for, for this recognition to take place? It's not Global South universities, it's Global North universities. And so my question is, should we just delink, um, essentially? And then, I mean, for me, there is, we, if, if when we talk about decolonization, we need to talk about the language question because in um, the, the, the whole field of coloniality of language, um, which is essentially this um, alignment between language, race, and dehumanization, um, how our languages came to be seen as inferior is um, because um, of the fact that the expressive tools that we use was not seen as being able to carry knowledge. And as we know, there's a dynamic link between knowledge and reality, knowledge, language and, and reality, and, and carrying certain cultures and, and, and knowledge is within them. So um, for me, this is quite important. And I also wanted to ask, um, because I want, to, I want to bring it to the ground, is I want to practicalize it. Um, is there, there, for me, there is a, a, a relationship between language, the language question, and the mater materiality, um, economic materiality, political materiality. So, should that not be a central question as a whole? So, um, yes. That is essentially my concern with slash question. I think there were almost two or three questions from each speaker, Prof. So I'll allow those because I think they sounded as if there were five or six questions in between all of that. And I'll take the next round. I'll start my question off as the next round. Okay. Well, I, I, that was excellent. It shows that you are really working very hard on this, uh, on these issues. Well, the colonization. What does it mean? It means. Um, the, the attempt the attempt to neutralize first whatever decolonizing efforts are being taken to begin with and secondly to do so in a way that uh, reproduces ontological degradation that is to say creates subhumanity people that have a minus minus value so to say right why is that being doing? Is is being done? It's being done, in my view, for several reasons. Uh, I think that now uh, capitalism has reached the point in which Marx, in in, uh, in volume three of Capital, says that land would be the last uh, item or item of of life that capitalism will conquer. Because land is more difficult to commercialize, to become a commodity. You know? Now land is a commodity. Now it's becoming a commodity. China is buying land in Africa. South Korea is buying land in Africa. Saudi Arabia is buying land in Africa. What are they buying land? To feed the Africans? No, of course not. They are doing that sometimes to create food reserves for their own country because they are afraid of the future shortages and also because they want water. Because they know that by 2030, 50% of the population will have a potable water problem. Actually, I was in Makanda and on Sunday I didn't have water. I was quite surprised, uh, but shouldn't be surprised. So they want water. 
uh, a big firm that probably you know the name, Nestlé, is buying the aquifers in, uh, in Latin America. Because now they are going to bottle your potable water in 20 years' time. There is no other. So, this uh, scramble for land, is a new scramble for Africa now taking place. Scramble for land. Well, it obliges <coughs> that this land is inhabited so by people. Come on, we have to devalue whatever the people are doing and whatever the people are in those lands to buy this land for nothing. They are buying at a very low price because these peasants are ignorant, they are illiterate, they don't know how to do agriculture, and therefore, in order to take hold of that land, and not just land for, uh, for aquifers, it's also land for agro-industrial uh, projects. In Mozambique, for instance, they are planning to expel from their land 4.5 million peasants because they are ignorant. They say, the system reproduces the idea the other as savage, as, as inferior, you know, to destroy. Because in our system, whatever in the northwestern, uh, north, northern epistemology, whatever is closer to nature is degraded. Women are closer to nature. That's why they are inferior. Blacks, peasants, and so on are indigenous people are close to nature. In, uh, in the 17th century, Indians were considered part of nature. By Locke and by Hobbes, they were part of nature. That's why they said that the, the land had no, nobody there. Terra nullius. Land of nothing, of nobody. Because they were not people. So this is one aspect of the recolonization, because it's the continuity. The colonizer did one thing, uh, of course, uh, the spread of uh, critical thinking and knowledge in the colonies, and secondly, preventing them from industrializing. What the British did in India, the Portuguese here, always the idea of preventing the industrialization. You know that your country is being deindustrialized now? Is losing industry. As Brazil is losing, because everything is going into commodity production. Mining, that's where the money is. Because, you know, this product here that I have, and you have 200 minerals are here, 200. And you know how many of these is it, exist in the world? 7 billion, 500 million of these products, because many people have more than one. More cell phones than people. Can you now be surprised that there is this scramble for minerals? Why Congo is in the situation it is? It's one of the richest countries for this type of minerals, as well as Mozambique. That Mozambique is going to be very difficult for that. So, is a new colonial overtaken for the natural resources, by violence. And they bring military forces, and that's one. The second form, I'll probably speak more about, but you know, you have the privilege of having my ideas firsthand, uh, is the digital colonialism. They are taking away your data that you put in the Facebook and you put in your networks. And this is today, there is even a concept of digital colonialism. Why it is colonialism? Is that you produce the data, but you do not control what they are going to do with the data. The large firms, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple, Apple, and Microsoft, they are all of them in favor of the free flow of data in order to process them. But where are they processed? They are processed in specific countries. India is the largest, uh, largest user of Facebook in the world. Produces an amount, an immense amount of data. Do you know where the data centers are? 15 data centers. 
United States, some countries in Europe, and Singapore. Not a single one in India. So this is colonialism. You extract a commodity, don't allow it to be enriched, so to say, treated there. And South Africa is alert for this. In Osaka, last week, uh, two weeks ago, there was a meeting about data flow. And South Africa, together with India and Indonesia, voted against the free flow of data. Why? They are trying to protect the data that are generated in South Africa. They should be treated here. At least there would be some employment. But the, their excuse, that's why your president and some vice chancellors are a, a bit exaggerated in their idea of leapfrogging into the future, that's the mantra now in South Africa, <laughs> uh, is that whenever you want to, to set up one of the data center, they say, well, yes, it would be wonderful, but we are sorry, you can't do that. Your electricity uh, grid is not uh, stable enough, is not strong enough. Your uh, internet grid is not widespread enough. So you are not. That is to say, you cannot cooperate in the fourth industrial revolution because you have not done the third industrial revolution. And probably not even the second one. So that's the trap that people are there. And the trap are they? all these companies are bringing all these traps to your president and they eat it out and pay for that. They pay for those lies. They pay dearly with your money, right? About China. Well, China is, the, is the, an incoming uh, emergent empire, while the United States is a declining empire. So there is now a struggle between these two empires. And we don't understand the world today without this struggle there, right? Empires are bad. They are only good for the centers of the empire. So I'm not saying that China is better than the United States or vice versa. I think that the United States is vicious because it's destroying the humanity because it has a military force to do that, what they are doing. In Yemen, what they have done, in, in Iraq, what they have done throughout. I mean, I'm very critical. And I've lived for 35 years in the United States, half year. But b because of that, I know very well what's going on. Right? Very unjust society. The middle classes are dying away because all the money goes to the military to launch several bombs a day everywhere. They are always launching bombs, dropping bombs everywhere. China is, a, is an emerging empire. The emerging empire doesn't emerge by violence and by convincing people. It's always like that. So they come, religion was locked down. Religion was an imposition, but was a persuasion also for people. It was not just by violence. Right? So what they do is now the road and belt initiative. Like in Nairobi, you know, the trains, all this connecting, connectivity is so that the Chinese products will be available throughout the world. So it is an imperial strategy. And the Chinese are a very old country. And in fact, there's a culture much older than the European culture. So finally, they, they think that they will be able to come to power, global power. And the United States is in difficulty. For instance, they wanted to forbid this machine. This machine is Chinese. The way. That's my cell phone. They say, well, we are going to forbid the way from using our patented uh, uh, part of the, you know, the operating models are, by, are patented and are patented by American companies. What did the Chinese do? You know, many workers work for, uh, for uh, Apple in China. One million and a half workers. China said, well, next day they will be all out of work. And you get out of here. Apple didn't have any problem with that. Of course, it would be unemployment. They don't, wouldn't care. But the price of Apple, the machine, how much would go up? Apple was really uh, a bit careful. 
and said to the president, abandon the idea. So it has all over, Trump says one thing and then it has to retreat. Because, you know, they have 20, million, 20 trillion of foreign debt. 66 trillion are in the hands of the Chinese creditors. So China advanced a lot. And now it's really the incoming power. And in Latin America is a fierce battle. Venezuela and all this, you know, Brazil. You can understand that. It is really a new imperialism. How it's going to trickle down in forms of colonial operation in the countries, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. One thing that, uh, the, 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 I don't know, you don't remember, but when China started entering here in, in, in Africa, it was a very smart move by the, by the Chinese. And it was following. You know, we, you, we, we respect your sovereignty. So do you need money? We lend you money. Do you have our money? We are not going to ask about human rights. Because the Europeans at the time, 70s, 60s, 70s, both the United States and, the, and the Europe had come as a condition to lend money to Africa if the countries would respect the human rights. The Chinese came and said, this is your question. This is not for us to decide whether you respect human rights or not. We'll lend you the money. And that's why they the largest investor in many countries in Africa today. Well, the Abyss line, yeah, I think that you did a very good analysis and it looks like you read my, my work because uh, uh, everything has to do with what I've been doing, which is all this, uh, uh, which I call the monoculture of the linear time, the idea that there is an evolution. And the, the countries that are at the top of the arrow, the arrow are the most developed countries, and uh, the ones are the least developed countries. So the concept of development was created to create underdevelopment, to show the world that most countries in the world are underdeveloped. So they, have no, no, they should have no voice because they are underdeveloped. And if they want to be developed, they, can, they have to be developed like the others, so capitalist development. So that was the trap of the concept of development, which we should never have accepted in social sciences. And that's why the indigenous people now in, in Latin America come with other concepts to discuss development. And that's why at Witz, Tsepo put me together with Mogoba Ramosa to discuss uh, the idea of uh, Ubuntu with Summa Causae, Ubuntu African, Summa Causae Latin America. Can we discuss these things as alternatives to development? So we are discussing these things now, right? So, state of nature, of course, was their presupposition to justify colonialism. Because the state of nature is a state of savagery. It is, no, if, you, if we go into detail, it's not like that. Because there are people that have a different view. For instance, for Rousseau, the state of nature, it was a paradise. For Locke and for Hobbes, it was an horrible thing. Because it was savage killing each other. And we need a social pact. Social pact. But for Rousseau, was the, the, the good savage. In savage societies, everything that would be wonderful, they wouldn't kill anyone, it would be harmony, they would uh, have sexual relations free, there would be no institutions, that would be paradise, right? But that's Rousseau. Rousseau was a kind of an awkward figure for them. So I think that we, adopt, we adopted in Africa all this rubbish, so to say, the, the, the linear time, very uncritically. For instance, I'm surprised that when I'm discussing here in South Africa, the questions of the university, everybody starts with uh, the modern universities that you have here in Africa, no? that started with colonialism. Nobody ever mentions the pre-modern universities. You know that the first universities in the world were African? Timbuktu in Mali? 
in Al Azhar in Egypt. These two universities were founded in the 9th century. The first European university is the 11th century. Why don't you consider that as part of your heritage? How many revolutions took place in Africa before the first revolution, uh, industrial revolution? But now you accept that you are in the fourth industrial revolution. It's an Eurocentric, Eurocentric reading of the revolutions. Lots of evolutions and revolution of peasant societies, because after all, humankind probably was born in this continent. Can you imagine how many revolutions they have to do to reach the stage in which we are before the first industrial revolution? How many revolutions the Chinese did? We receive students in the United States who say, well, the first industrial revolution took place and so on and so forth. And the Chinese look at us and say, well, but, you know, what about China? We invented gunpowder, we invented printing. We're the, the Europeans. We know now that China discovered America much before the Portuguese or the Spaniards. They went by the Pacific, but they didn't occupy. And because they didn't occupy, it doesn't count as discovery, but they were there because now we know the rest of the ships and they are narratives. Two centuries before, the history has been done totally Eurocentrically. And that's why it's wrong, we have to undo it. So I think that uh, this reading of phases is absolutely uh, fraudulent. I don't believe in the concept of the progress because otherwise how can I justify Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is this progress? Is the destruction of the planet uh, the progress? This is the achievement of, of progress, it's just destroy the planet. We have to have other concepts uh, that allow us to have a more harmonious life with nature. I'm always struck by the fact that 70 75% of the Biodiversity is in the indigenous lands. 75%. Peasant and indigenous lands. Also, that is to say, the peasants and the indigenous are the guardians of biodiversity that we badly need. When they fight for that, they don't fight for them, they fight for us, for the world. That's the way I see. As the language, Chanel, I think we discussed last night also already uh, a little bit. I think that, in fact, you are also in the process of linguicide. I mean, almost every year languages disappear. And disappear basically because, uh, you know, I'm here discussing with you. This is not my native language. So I have to use it so that you understand me. And probably some of you had other languages other than English, right? So I think that we have uh, to acknowledge that the idea that multilingualism multi should be a great contribution to intercultural translation in our schools. I think that we should be much more multilingual. It is good for the brain, it is good for intelligence, as they say, but it would be very good for the culture. You have 11 languages here, official languages in South Africa with English, right? Well, why shouldn't there be an incentive for people to learn all the other languages or some of the other languages and not just learning Chinese as many here want now? Uh, because I think it would be a way of retrieving the past, retrieving also other experiences, things that we can say in other languages. Uh, I mentioned yesterday, and, and, and of course you know the, the work of Vationgo on decolonizing the mind, the African mind, has to do with language. And I also mentioned you the quasi biredu. Why uh, certain conce uh, philosophical concepts of uh, European philosophy cannot be said in Akan, in, uh, uh, in one of the languages in Ghana, but that language allows us to say things that European language do not allow. For instance, this idea that we'll discuss a little bit like Ubuntu, 
I, I am because you are or something like that. Well, there is no concept, no concept in the Eurocentric knowledge that allows that. Because we are to focus on the idea of the I, the individual. So I think, therefore I am. And what Kvasi says, well, I cannot translate this in Akan. Because I does not exist. I am here. I am son of. I am here on them. There is not a I. And there is not a M. Because I am from this village, I am from this community, I am from here. So there is no M abstract. No? And I never the word think. We don't think. We think something. And we think acting on something. So thinking and acting in our language is the same word. How can I say think? If thing is the same word as acting, as doing. See? But then he says things that he says, for instance, we wrestle with the concept of praxis, how you unite theory and practices. It's a big problem for Western language. It's no problem for Akka. It's, there are several concepts in which theory and practice are together. So each language has limitations, as any other knowledge, and has uh, potentialities for saying th different things. Besides, there is one aspect that you didn't mention, is the question of orality. Because many languages are rendered uh, orally. And I've been working a lot on oral knowledge. And it was uh, a linguist from this uh, continent. Uh, in fact, was assassinated by, by uh, the, the, the Amin uh, in Burkina Faso, a dictator. The concept is oratura. To say we have literature and we should have orature, not oral tradition, oral is a derivation of the literature, it's secondary. So the important thing is literary, the written knowledge. And the other is oral. He said, no, the oral should be a way, a concept fully dignified, oratura, oratura. You, you find that in my book, uh, The End of Cognitive Empire. I have a, a chapter on demonumentalizing written knowledge demonumentalizing written knowledge and the oral knowledge, which changes all the time. Uh, you don't find them. It's not easy to find the author of the oral knowledge. That's a, the question. Authorship. You know? At the same time, there is oral knowledge with super authors. The sage, the wise people in a community, or the liberation leaders. Nelson Mandela this, said this and that. Steve Biko said this and that. When we put those words, they have a special weight. They are what I call super authors. But there are people that have no power in our communities, like the wise people, sage, old people, but they have authority. And whatever they say, people are waiting for the elder, elder's word. And some of them are the ones that have access to the ancestors. And the ancestors is a very key word in this culture. Who can get that? There is no written knowledge that can give you what the ancestors are thinking about what you are doing now in South Africa. But the ancestors are living that. And for this culture, there is something that Western culture does not understand. Because either we are living or you are dead. Nothing that is dead can be living, and can, is living can be dead. It's a very binary way of thinking. And it's that strange. Because most cultures are not binaries. They're complementary. Okay. Are more questions or not? Um, Otherwise, I'm liberated. <laughs> no, you want a question? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm just sad that Ule Mohang isn't here to, to, to sort of uh, give input, uh, but around what she was talking about, around healing, 
Um, I'm inclined to sometimes think that we, as, as if we can consider ourselves as post-colonial objects, uh, or consider ourselves as just the oppressor of the subaltern, we seek healing in lots of different places. But I, I'm more inclined to think that it's not even that we're seeking healing from colonization, but we're seeking a restoration of wholeness, mm -hmm. as maybe Utisani would have said. Um, and if we think about how people relate to resistance to their movements or organizations, or social movements, um, we're seeking restoration and we're seeking this restoration of wholeness there as well. And with this fragmentation of resistance and the fragmentations of um, the social movements, as we have seen them even among students, where FISMAS Hall started at this group of students and it fragments along cleavages of gender, then fragments again along cleavages of uh, classes and so on. Um, we're, we're constantly seeking this restoration of wholeness. And then in the sense of research as well, as post as post um, as uh, postgraduate students, we're also, whenever we go out into communities and interview and so on, we're also trying to do some kind of restoration of wholeness there through the research as being custodians of people's lived experiences. So I suppose I'm asking that when we think about the abyssal line or an abyssal line, there's constantly going to be what exists and what doesn't exist. Um, for example, if we think in forms of feminist epistemologies, people that are thinking that they're on the margin at the moment are transgender people. So we have then again another line being drawn around what exists and what doesn't exist. And how do we overcome that in the type of research that needs to come out um, so that we do in essence I don't know if we even if it's arrogant to think that we can provide that restoration of wholeness through research um, when we're trying to excavate and make seem what was not seen or didn't exist before. No, I think that uh, today, uh, at this stage in the continent, and particularly in South Africa. I think that the informal curriculum is much more important than the formal curriculum. I think that these reading clubs that you have should proliferate and um, you should be able to dedicate more time to discuss among ourselves because I think you learn more fr from your fo yourself, from other students, than you'll be able to learn from professors. Not the professors are not going to teach you something, but you should be prepared to apprehend and select what the professor is telling you and is favorable to your struggle and what is really, uh, really trying to uh, give up the struggle or saying that your struggle doesn't pay. For instance, so with uh, Lemon when she was here, uh, is the idea that, you know, a professor can in fact uh, respond to her, yes, uh, there's nothing that we can do, you know, racism is always there, you have to tell you, go to the, the doctor and try to get some pills and uh, uh, some therapy and so on, if you are so anxious, so anxious about uh, race, uh, about things like that. So we have to prepare, education is a way of expanding subjectivities. But how do we expand subjectivities? We, we expand by knowing first our heritage, our culture. And once you know your culture, then you reach out without losing self-esteem. Now, in order to learn at this place as university, you have to lose your self-esteem because you are made ignorant all the time. You know, the things that that come from a different culture that you have learned in your community, your grandmother, what she told you about this and divination and sons. And, and this is rubbish from the point of view of the things here. It's not interesting anymore, right? So I think that you have to be very much aware of your heritage, not to stay with it, because then becomes conservative in a sense, no? But then reach out. Then you can take from your culture Many feminists today in Africa are doing that. I've been working with several of them. Well, there is a current, as you know, of black feminists that's, that really have eliminated, are very much against the 
customary laws and uh, uh, African culture because it's male chauvinistic type of culture and we have to get rid of it and go into a Western kind of knowledge, right? There are others that think, no, we have to keep our culture and transform it from the inside. Because after all, no culture is perfect and no culture is absolutely rigid. So they change and they have been changing. People, you know, I, I have no experience here from South Africa, but I have from Mozambique and I have from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Latin America, from several countries. But it's the idea that uh, peasants, here in Mozambique, that peasants were even ma more male chauvinists than the urban black men. That was the position of the women's movement in Mozambique. Then we organized something that I would like that, you know, I would come back here if they would organize this at Nelson Mandela. is a, a counter university that we organize. Uh, two days of uh, workshops in which we bring together intellectuals and social movements. In residence, they have to sleep in the same premises, same hotel, have dinner, dance, drink at night and so on. Total conviviality there. One third academics, two thirds different social movements. Lesbian, peasants, uh, women, and so on. So we had a meeting, and uh, after that meeting, it was fabulous to see the declarations. We even have a public declaration in Portuguese. They said the, the one thing is for the women was that I didn't know that in fact there was so so many peasants who were really concerned about the women's struggle. We thought they were all of them male chauvinists, and that's not true. Secondly, we thought that we women have a struggle and peasants have another struggle. Our struggle is for a liberation of, uh, against uh, male chauvinism and so on. Their struggle is for land. No, this is Western-centric. In Africa, the struggle for land is a feminist struggle. So this is quite an advance. It goes against all the mantra of the feminist movement, North-centric feminist. This land issue is not an issue. Or the economic, political economy is not an issue because they are always asking for the, the, the role of the woman in the economy. But look at the, the commerce between Mozambique and, the, and the, the smuggling, informal commerce between Mozambique and South Africa. Who controls that? Women, only women. We have done a study with them that is a fascinating. They are entrepreneurs, but they are not the entrepreneurs of new type. The, the entrepreneurs that in order to win, the other has to fail. They help each other, but they are good entrepreneurs. So they don't need someone telling them that they owe them access to the, the economy because really they control the economy of the commerce there. So different realities, right? So. Uh, and it's full of uh, prejudices in this way. So, okay, my friends, two hours, yeah. Um, so my name is Nzika. Um, well, it's, it's just a question. Um, it's cold in here. Um, I'm no. thinking, um, um, well, I guess in a way it provoked me to think in terms of the language which was mentioned. Um, you know. So I'm wondering, uh, more especially, uh, at least this is something I constantly struggle with at the moment um, when it comes to uh, decolonization for, for example. I know this is not what it should be, but in any case, this is what is happening at the moment. There's a tendency for it to be expropriated, if I can use that word, um, by, by um, some people uh, to such that it, in a way, um, produces certain terms and references of um, uh, how to enter being African or Africanity or blackness for them. So, so what you find within that, it tends to produce in a way a certain similar types of exclusions as it, uh, um, uh, uh, whiteness or colonialism, uh, racism has produced. And so I'm thinking now, but even drawing from the question of the language, uh, especially when people tend to talk around the idea of an African solution, which tends to really um, 
close off, you know, uh, and again, like I said, uh, the idea, there are certain people who are excluded, again, with this idea of being an African. So, what do you think about this idea then of co-creation co uh, when we try to think about a new world? More especially, as you said, um, you had a debate around Ubuntu and, um, I forgot the other word you yeah, used, but, yeah. um, So, what do you think around this idea of co-creation for as, as a way of trying to find solutions for a better world, uh, if I make sense? No, it's it's good. It's very central to my to my way of thinking. By the way, you have a shirt with a good friend, the 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 face of a good friend of mine. I was with the movement also. Florestan Fernandes was a great sociologist from Brazil. Yeah, I was I was at the uh, Florestan. The 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 school in in uh, in São Paulo. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, we gave him the the doctor honoris causa in my university. Wow. I was a good friend of his. Uh, no, I think that basically, um, uh, you know, uh, for me, the only way of um, making credible the epistemologies of the South is to transform the know about into know with. When we are dealing with the oppressed, you know, the, the different people that have struggled against the injustice of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy, right? So, if you know where, there is a co-creation, right? So, the, 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 the distinction between information and knowledge collapses. Because when I'm interviewing someone, I have an idea that the, I have the knowledge, he has or she has the information. I don't consider what she said, uh, says as information. This is extractivism. This is extracting a resource. I, I don't like that. One, one student one day asked me at Burbank College whether we could write a doctoral thesis within the frame of the epistemology of the South. Because I really said that most theses should be co-authored. Because you go to a community, you work with a community, you have been there living with them, they are explaining to you what things are, and all of a sudden you write a piece and the piece is yours, and they don't exist. I think that in the future you have to accept co-authorships, in particular for people that do community studies. Of course, you can be documentary studies and other things, but if you do community studies, I think we should do more and more co-authorship because now uh, there is one thing that we in methodology deal a lot in many countries is the research fatigue. The people in the communities are tired of giving interviews to students. They come with questions, questionnaires, surveys, and people in psychology are worse in, in many years are always asking the same questions, some, some questions for free. And what is the result? They never go back to the community to tell them, well, we did a study, our conclusions were this. That's something that we did in the 70s. When I finished my PhD thesis, I lived in a favela, in a squatter settlement for several months in Brazil to live with the people there. I, I rented a shack and I lived there to write my thesis, to learn what they were doing. Well, my first responsibility was what we call devolution. We have to go back to the community, tell them, well, I did this work, I did this, I came to this conclusion, and so on and so forth. So I think that not even that is done today. I mean, the idea of co-creation is very serious because that's what it is. And if you co-create, and if knowledge is not separate from the struggle, you have to be in the struggle. And you have to take some risks. There is no other way. And sometimes there are situations you know, in which there are risks. So for instance, now racism in Europe. You have to see which side are you on of the, race, the racism. Uh, two rappers that were, I work a lot with rappers. Uh, uh, I even write lyrics for rappers. So, uh, and I work a lot with them. And one of them was the mediator between a shanty town in Lisbon, black, most of them come from Cape Verde Islands, 
and the police. When he came to the police to complain that the police was uh, misbehaving against a child in the community, the police started beating him. Let me ask, the guy is uh, uh, finishing the PhD in uh, communication at the University of Lisbon and a great rapper. That, that's the specificity that he doesn't write or sing in Portuguese. He sings in Criollo, which is the language of Cape Verde. Right? And they start beating up. It was a big scandal. And we organized a protest. And uh, who went to the European Parliament, uh, party by party, to defending him? I was there. And they always know when I need, you were there. So if you are in a struggle, Many people say, where were you? Were you isolated in your university or you came down to our struggle here? If you agree with the struggle, you may not agree with that, but if you agree. So I think that we have to take more seriously the idea that our citizenship has to be a partisan, has been very active citizenship. And I think we are being trained to be conformists at our universities and, uh, and not rebels. Basically, that's what they do. So, but if there are alternatives, as you can see, we can discuss these alternatives. It's, it's just, um, it took me some time to get to the conclusion that it's not enough to have this will to fight. I have to have knowledge that allows me to fight. And if I go by scientific knowledge only, I never get that because the other guys are ignorant. I have to be the avant-garde. I have the one that has, says the truth. I'm not an avant-garde, a, 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 a avant type of intellectual. I'm a, a rear-guard, as I say. I go behind the social movements, not ahead of them. See? It's a different portrait that we have to create. It takes a long time. But this afternoon we'll be discussing more about these things, right? Well, we've been here for two hours. At 12 o'clock, thank you so much for indulging us with all the questions that we've had. Um, Dimulian and Abuni guys for giving the Shalini to come through. Um, I know that a lot of you are busy with lectures as well, uh, but thank you for accommodating the shift in time. For your time, thank you so much. Um, I think it's always wonderful when students um, are, are engaged in one with. Uh,